Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video and a great diagnostic top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any future videos. Today's list provides 10 questions to test for truth. It seems the old devil knows his time is short and is reintroducing every heresy the church has ever faced. People used to get all their teaching at the local church, but now it's the internet with a whole smorgasbord of who knows what. How do we discern the pure word from the poison? Let's take a look at God's lie detector. Very important top 10 here. Uh, let's go ahead and get started with number one. Does it confuse the persons of the Godhead? Right, what we think about God, Tozer said, is the most important thing about us. And let's remember that this war started by an attack on God himself. I will be as God, said the devil. Now, there are many, many verses that teach the three-in-one God. For example, in 1 Peter, he begins his letter by saying, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And Jude finishes his little book by saying, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, Praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And so when people say that the Trinity isn't taught in the Bible, they're not reading the same Bible. We find this many places. And so it's like time, space, and matter. We recognize that all of them are part of our material world, and yet time is three in one future, present, past, we wouldn't confuse the future and the present and the past, even though they're all linked together. They're all time. But we're not saying that the future is the past or the past is the present, just like we're not saying the Father is the Son or the Son is the Spirit. But the future is time, the past is time, the present is time. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God. And if we can keep this clear and understand that the idea of the Trinity is essential for our understanding of a God of love. People who have only an undivided God, a God who is not, as the Bible teaches, this beautiful picture of the three-in-one God, if they don't believe that, then the love of God, when there was no creation, would have to be self-love. But we understand that the Father loved the Son in the bond of the Spirit. And they were in perfect harmony with one another. This is a very difficult doctrine. Great is the mystery of godliness. And yet God has revealed himself in this way. And he tells us that the physical creation has his fingerprint on it. And when we look at time, space, and matter and realize that this is three in one. There's only one universe. And yet the universe reveals itself in time, space, and matter. You can't have two out of three. Everything has to exist in time, be made of matter, and occupy space. And so God has given us this object lesson in the physical world to understand something of what God is like. And if we confuse these things, we can end up with heresy. And if we ever hear not just this, but any of these, of these 10, someone teaching something that should be a little red flag is why this list is so helpful. Exactly. Number two, does it demean the person of Christ? Right. Any doctrine that lowers my appreciation for Christ has to be wrong. The scripture says that in all things he must have the preeminence. He's the altogether lovely one. And so anything that diminishes my, my appreciation for Christ it's going to be wrong. Most of the false cults either attack the person of Christ, deny his deity, for example, or they attack the work of Christ relative to salvation at the cross. So we need to avoid that like the plague. 
what think ye of Christ, said Martin Luther, what think ye of Christ is the test to try both your state and your scheme. You cannot think right in the rest if you do not think rightly of him. Number three, does it unduly emphasize the Holy Spirit? We have to understand who the Holy Spirit is and what he does, but it's like looking at a telescope to understand how it works. At a certain point, we want to look through the telescope. John 16, verses 13 and 14 are important in this regard. The Lord Jesus in the upper room promised the coming of the Holy Spirit, but he said, he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will tell you things to come, he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So when the Lord Jesus was here, he came to reveal the Father. He veiled his own glory. When the Spirit came, he came to reveal the Son. And so any movement that is constantly referring to being slain in the Spirit and laughing in the Spirit and the filling and the baptism, the symbols are all the dove and the oil and so on, we need to be a little suspect and say, wait a minute, are you over-exaggerating something and looking at the telescope instead of through it? The purpose of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, important though he is, is to reveal Christ to us. So be careful of any movement that turns upside down the order of the Holy Trinity. The Holy Spirit, the third person, is here to show us Christ. And then number four, does it falsely elevate humanity? Any movement, any teaching that elevates the man apart from the work of Christ or apart from the ministry of the Holy Spirit is wrong. I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. And so all of the assets that I have can be traced to the ministry of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit. And so any movement that is tainted with this spirit that we see in the world today that elevates man is wrong and it's dangerous. And so we need to be careful that the work of grace in our lives through the cross and through the ministry of the Holy Spirit is the only way that man can be elevated through grace. Number five, does this teaching depend on an obscure verse or a forced interpretation? So if some verse, some obscure verse, is being used to advance a certain agenda, we need to be careful. If one verse contradicts all the other clear statements on a particular idea, then obviously we always go from the clear to the obscure, not the other way around. People say, well, you know, the Bible can say anything. Well, it can if you take it out of context, if you don't use the rules of interpretation. So the Bible says there is no God, but it happens to be quoting a fool at the time. So if we don't understand verses in context, we can get into trouble. And just a little hint, when you're talking to someone from a cult, very often they will read a verse, and one of the best things you can do, even if you don't quite know the answer to that, is say, could we just read the whole chapter? And what do you know? It's not too long until you see that the Spirit of God has provided for us in that context an answer to the problem. Now we have a classic illustration. There are those who teach that at the celebration of the Lord's Supper, the body and blood of the Lord become real in the bread and wine. And they base this on the story when the Lord Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. Well, the great thing about it is that they didn't understand it in that day either. And they were confused. Even the disciples didn't get it. And so Jesus addressed the issue and explained to them, first of all, what if you see the Son of Man go up where he was before? Oh, in other words, I plan on taking my body with me when I go to heaven. I'm not going to leave it here for you to chew on. And secondly, he said, the flesh profits nothing. It's the spirit that gives life. I'm not talking about physical body. I'm talking about a spiritual reality. 
So right in the context, the answer is given. Just read a few verses, and before you know it, there's the answer right there. Those cultists in John 1 who say that Jesus was a God, but not the God, well, just read the rest of the paragraph. And before you know it, you're reading statements like that the Word was God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we see the manifestation of his glory. And so, as we read through John 1, anyone who has eyes to see will recognize this is God in the flesh. So I think that's a great thing to remember. It's verses out of context that cause trouble. And that's why Christians need to be careful that they don't use verses out of context, because it sets a bad precedent for those who have been led astray. And for our viewers at home, we do have another top 10 list for Bible interpretation and helps there. <laughs> Very good. Uh, number six, does it excuse or encourage wrong behavior? The Apostle Paul quite often when he's referring to doctrine, which simply means teaching, he uses a word healthful, like not just healthy in itself, but producing health in us. And you should be able to tell a man's doctrine by his practice. So, for example, he that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he's pure. So, if a doctrine makes me materialistic, if it makes me selfish, I know it's, it's wrong, I've got it wrong. So, there are those who have embraced certain ideas that have led them into polygamy, for example, into licentious living. We know it's wrong because the fruit of it is wrong. And so you know the root by the fruit. Well, that statement, by its fruit you will know it, is actually referring to false teachers. And so when you see the fruit of their teaching, which is self-aggrandizement, living lavishly, careless, sensual lives, you know that the root is bad, if the fruit is bad. Then number seven, does it confuse the distinctions between Israel, the kingdom, and the church? This is very common. You'll find people today and they're trying to live under the last dispensation and trying to fulfill the law that was given to the Jewish nation. You'll find people who are trying to live in the next dispensation, and they're trying to bring in the kingdom. Now, there is some overlap. There are those who are Jews, true Jews, who are now in the church. And it seems that the church will be included in the kingdom. But quite clearly, Christ is never referred to as the king of the church. And why is that? Because we're his co-regent, we're his queen, so to speak. We will reign with him, not as his subjects, but as his bride. If you want to see how a subject should behave, you should be able to look at the queen. She has an added incentive. She loves the king, and so she should be a model citizen. Even though she's not technically under the law of the king, it's a love relationship still. So when we read through the Bible, we need to make those distinctions. A classic example is these 11 men that Jesus was teaching. Sometimes they represent the embryonic church, as in John 13 and 14 and 15 and 16, because they are the apostles, the foundation stones for the church. But they had a dual role. They are also going to sit in 12 thrones over the 12 tribes of Israel. And so sometimes they act as representative Israel. When in Matthew 24, the Lord gives teaching to warn the Jewish people how to flee in the midst of the time of Jacob's trouble, make sure you don't flee on the Sabbath day, there he's referring to them in their role with the nation of Israel. So we can't jump to conclusions, we've got to look at the context again, but we have to keep these distinctions or we really muddy the waters. Then number eight, does it focus on the temporal instead of the eternal, on the material instead of the spiritual? By the way, just on that last point, I was going to mention that there's a book by William MacDonald published by Gospel Folio Press, and that's a very helpful book, distinguishing these things, 
that have to be, we have to make a difference or we get into trouble. Does it focus on the temporal instead of the eternal, on the material instead of the spiritual? Yeah, the health and wealth gospel is an example of this. Hebrews 13.5 says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Now that flies right in the face of that whole idea. And people have ended up being superficial, accepting physical miracles and missing out on the spiritual miracles. The Lord Jesus said, greater things than these will you do. And he's referring not only to the number of miracles that would occur, but to the spiritual nature of them. Jesus gave physical bread to people so they could physically be sustained, but we have the opportunity of giving out spiritual food so that people can actually come back to life. So we don't want to miss the glorious blessings. Do we believe in miracles today? Absolutely, more than ever. But the miracles by and large are of a spiritual nature and the Lord Jesus explained that to his disciples. So we don't want to be fooled into thinking that the will of God is the same thing as the American dream. Then number nine, is it a thinly disguised version of a contemporary secular trend? If we're a little bit familiar with how the world is thinking, don't be surprised if those ideas show up in the church in Christian dress. So existentialism is a movement that basically says experience is the thing, experience is the goal. And there are influences in the church that emphasize not so much the quality as the quantity of the experience. And we need to be careful that we don't be fooled into thinking that the experience is the thing. And then secondly, postmodernism, this idea that there is no absolute truth and this has also crept into the church. And so there's a whole group of people that have embraced this idea post-truth generation. And if ever you're on a slippery slope, that's it. So the wisdom of the world is foolishness in God's sight. And we want to stay away from that. We need to be aware of these movements. The whole feminist movement, while there were some good aspects to it, it has undermined the value of motherhood and the role of women and has tried to make women competitors with men instead of compliments. So watch out for these philosophies in the world that have snuck into the church. And finally, number 10, is it believed by those whom I know to be walking with the Lord? So this is the final test and it's a good one. Never believe people just because they're nice or they seem to be spiritual. Paul commended the Brians because they went home and checked up on him. He wasn't afraid to let them put it to the test test everything by the book. And Paul warns and says that false prophets, false apostles can transform themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for he says Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. So don't be fooled. With fair sounding speeches, they waylay the simple. And they make poor widows houses. And they uses fair sounding speeches to gather disciples after themselves. Paul said, men of your own selves speaking perverse things. So yes, there are wolves outside, but there are also men of your own selves. And that word speaking perverse things means truth with a twist. And so there is an element of truth to it and that's what makes it so dangerous. We have to constantly go back and test it by the book. And if we do, with the Spirit's help, God will keep us on the straight and narrow, and that's where we want to be.